enter music because you love music. And you want to know more about what it is, how it makes yourself tick, and how it makes people tick. And that's a fascinating study, right, isn't it? Sound and how it affects the emotions of human beings. It's quite tremendous. We're all keepers, kind of museum curators of this old music. So if we, you don't have live players to play Beethoven and Mozart and Brahms, it's just pieces of paper that sit somewhere, you know? They meant for it to be performed. This is a violin. It has four strings. It's made of wood. And this is a bow. This is horse hair. And you put some rosin in it so it can grab the string and produce sound when you pull it. This is a French horn. And it makes pretty sounds. Well, I've got a cello in this hand. In this hand, I have the bow, which is wood as well. Well, this is specifically a clarinet that just has one reed that attaches to a mouthpiece that vibrates against the mouthpiece to create sound. And you just go like this and you do the same motion in your horn, so. The player controls with their fingers which key they hit. You tighten it, create tension. When you pull the bow across the string, the string moves in a circular motion and you get a big sound. Our role is sometimes to act as a bass and other times to take the melody. For me, it's kind of the singer of the group. We have a lot of solo. For that soft tone, it sounds really nice. I just love the sound of the clarinet. It has a fluidity between the notes that I think not many of the other instruments can achieve. And then just the range and the expressiveness. Left hand pizzicato. It just makes me happy to play it. When you are with your instrument, you are yourself and music, and that's it. Like, you can forget out everything else. Nothing else exists, and that's very beautiful for me. The first thing you do as a musician is to learn about the composer, about the historic context of the piece. Each piece of music has like their own uh, purpose, their own meaning. We try to get in the composer's head and understand what they were thinking because the historical context is a big part of what makes this piece this piece. Egmont is a story about a revolutionary, the Count of Egmont. It tells the story of a people that fought for liberty. The Egmont Overture is a very powerful piece of music written at a very fragile time of Viennese history as well as Beethoven's own life. And this came out of a kind of a dark time when Napoleon was invading Vienna. And it's ironic because Napoleon was one of Beethoven's idols at first till he moved into his territory. If you'd never encountered struggle in your life, um, you probably wouldn't be very good at playing this piece. <laughs> it starts out very dramatic and very almost kind of a tragic sound to it. The whole orchestra starts with a unison F, although it's in different octaves. And then a diminuendo to two half note Fs. That's a declaration, that first phrase. These chords represent like the, the heavy grip of oppression and tyranny. And then as it kind of traverses through throughout several different moods, it starts out kind of dramatic. Then it gets really tense and kind of anxious. 
almost like you're anticipating something. And then it goes through kind of this little bit of a sad, quick, sad woodwind corral. And then it goes into a really joyous uh, finale. Like the hero has come to save the day is what it makes me think of. So it covers a lot. <laughs> Maybe the people or Egmont's wife who is pleading for his life, like compassion and mercy, because he had been taken to prison. And he's been condemned to execution. And then it goes on. Then he uses his very famous motive from the Fifth Symphony. Uh, he uses it in Egmont. It's a symbol for struggling and for conflict, internal conflict for Beethoven. And that for now, pa 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 pa. Ba, 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 ba. You can find it throughout most of his pieces. There's a passage alternating between like the pleading and the decision of the authority. One, two, three. And that is the moment of beheading Egmont. Is his head goes, foo! And then they put it on a pole and show the townspeople that's what happens to people that contradict us. You know, I actually didn't know that, that what that was until rehearsal today. But it makes sense. Like, you can hear the beheading, you know, with the very dramatic stroke of the string. Then there's a silence and a really pianissimo set of chords in the woodwinds. These chords, really dark uh, chords, silent, which is the grieving, people grieving for, for Eggman's death. And out of nowhere. There comes a uh, really Allegro con brio that illustrates and resembles the victory of Egmont's ideal, because after his death, his people decided to start the revolution. So his death was the spark. It is a roller coaster. There's a lot in it, but the more you understand, the more you enjoy, the more you get from it. I'm a fan of the intense moments. The last Allegro con Brio you know, is the hardest part. It's really fun to play. The coda, this beautiful chorale, Woodwind Chorale sets up this very, very, very exciting coda, which is very short, but says a lot. Good, <laughs> as loud as you possibly can. I think um, Beethoven was one of the greatest revolutionary in music, in all history. I think the way he composed reached people more, that's why people like it more, that's why he's one of the most famous composers. Why is it that we play it once and the next time we play it again, hopefully it's better, that's the point of a rehearsal, but it's different. It's not just better, but it's different. Fortissimo. Piano dolce. This thing has been played so many times, it's 200 years old. There's a set of ways to play each part. First note, forte, we talked about this, right? Forte diminuendo, strings, beautiful sound, right? Then the second time, orchestra fortissimo has to be fortissimo, then more vicious sounds in the strings, right? My general process is just kind of like glancing through it, play through it, see what is technically challenging that I'm going to have to spend time working fingers out on. Um, and then spending time, okay, like where's the lyric melodic stuff that needs to be played very pretty and very in tune. 
After I've done my warm up, I'll go through and um, just play through difficult parts. And even on the parts that are easy, I usually try to run those with a drone so I know that I'm in tune. So I practice it every day, just really working on intonation and tone quality. I practice my part first, play through it. Then, um, you know, I have some different clarinetists on YouTube that do videos of like, this is how I play this excerpt. So I listen to a couple different those to see how they interpret it. Then, you, then I like to start listening to recordings of the full orchestra so I can hear, okay, I know my part really well, now I can find it within all these different little threads that are going on. Okay. And then in rehearsals, you just, you have to react to the other musicians around you. You know, however the recordings have done it, you know, our, our principal oboe player is gonna perform it differently and listen to what he does and then respond accordingly to that, kind of a conversation but with our instruments. We're listening to our cells, we're listening to our section, and how our section fits in with the ensemble. I always try to match the sound of the person next to me. First stands were together, that's very good. Everybody else, you gotta pay attention. Together on the eight notes. Feel the pulse. They need my ears. It has to be exact. I function more as a coach. Not together, right? You're faster than them. Okay, once again. So if you think about a football coach, they sit on the sidelines and all of them. I'm a little more active than that because I actually am part of the ensemble. Horns a little more, bop, 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 right? More rhythmic. The conductor is there to give you information, but it's your job to um, play with the rest of the musicians on stage, not with the conductor. With optimism. He gives us the character of the thing that we're about to play. Feel the power! It's heroic at that point, right? It's simmer, simmer, simmer. Crescendo, crescendo, big fortissimo. The most important thing about a conductor is to engage the musician, like to transmit that energy that the, each piece required. Conductors do it through physical gestures, humor, sarcasm, all of the above. Get out of the way, Jeremy. Okay, violas, I felt the power. <laughs> that was good. He can tell us exactly what he wants by his facial expression and by his body language. Also, he needs to be the one who knows the most about the piece. Good. So even when it's pianissimo in Beethoven, you have to put a little articulation on it. Study precisely with this. Out of tune. No. He tells the musicians, are you out of tune? Like, that's too flat, that's too sharp. One, two. No, not together. One, two. Not together. One, two. Too loud. One, two. No, no don't fluff. Ta -ta -tum. Ta -ta -tum. Stay in the string, no fluff. I need to, of course, set time, tempos, and, 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 and help them with um, interpretive issues. Soft, 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 so we can re-articulate. So if I do my job correctly, my gesture is giving them a good idea of what I think they should be sounding like. It's balancing between what I'm getting from the podium, what I'm hearing from the musicians around me, and then what that is inspiring me to do. One, two, three. No crescendo yet! Do not crescendo before it says to crescendo. Soft. Stop! Okay. Isn't it great? Typical Beethoven, you can see him again. Again! That's so good. How come you can't sound like that all the time? There's preliminary steps where you have to figure out entrances and initial bowings, intonation, and a bunch of other things that are preliminary to actually making music. That's kind of what we were doing today with some elements of music, but the more we play it, then the notes won't be an issue and then we 
play the music, not the notes on the page. Let's do this correctly, and then we'll stop rehearsing. When you have mastered it, all like technical issues, uh, you can be free. Like you can just play it and feel your part of it. Like you're singing it with your soul, you're singing and speaking it with your instrument, and I think that's the ultimate goal as a performance. Last three bars, shall we? All of this great music is, is, is for us, the musicians, but it's really for the audience, right? It was created for the audience. You're communicating the musical ideas to the audience as best as you can, but you also want to put on a show. I think the most successful performance, it's when everybody, the whole orchestra, like work as a unit, like feel the music as one. When everyone moves together and when everyone's locked in, it helps you come in on time and it helps you feel the direction of the phrase. Live performance is wonderful because you never know what's going to happen. But with this group, they usually do better in performance because all their ears are focused. The audience is sitting right in front of them. If you're not in control of your playing, the adrenaline controls you, and that's very dangerous, Like because then you just don't know what's going to come out. But if you're in control of your adrenaline, that can help you to communicate the intensity that you're trying to communicate. I really like the energy on performance days, because everybody's super focused, like we're all really wanting to have the best performance possible, so everybody's really detail-oriented. And lots of really interesting things always happen. Always work, be responsible with your technique and your preparation, but the goal is to enjoy it, right? That's why we're doing this. Have fun and express what the music wants to say.